Wow. How many people can feel the presence of God in this building? My God. Is it good to be in church on a Wednesday night? This is revival. Wow. Stay standing if you can for a moment. I've had the privilege to travel literally across the nation and around the world. You know, the Apostle Paul says there are many teachers but few fathers. And without a doubt, God has raised up a father in this city. Can we just thank your incredible senior leaders, Pastor Marco and Lisa. Thank you so much for your leadership. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for your courage. What an inspiring story. What a legacy. And it is such an honor to be on a journey of covenant relationship with you and uh, to, to be with you for the first time in, since you've taken the new building. I saw uh, the way seven or eight years ago it looked a lot different than it does now, and it is absolutely incredible what God has done. Can we just thank God for what he's already done? Isn't it amazing how one church is changing an entire city? It is just incredible. You can be seated. It is such an honor to be here on behalf of my wife, Lindsay, our three kids. Hopefully next time I can bring my three kids, especially my one-year-old daughter, Liviana. If you meet her, it will be the highlight of your entire life. She's absolutely amazing, and we hope to bring her here. Well, man, you guys are looking good tonight on a Wednesday night. Would you just turn to your neighbor and say this after me? Say, if it wasn't for you, say it real strong. Say, if it wasn't for you, I'd be the best looking person at revival night. <laughs> just find one more person saying, if it wasn't for you, I'd be the best dressed person at revival night. Pastor Marco, could you let me borrow those red pants, please? I need to elevate my game big time. How many people came hungry for God's word tonight? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that where two or three gather, there you are in the midst. And Father, we recognize your presence already in the building. Spirit of God, we thank you that you didn't come to simply make bad people good. You came to make dead people alive. And we thank you tonight that you are calling to life the eternal purposes of God over each and every person in this place. Each and every person watching online tonight. Lord, we create an altar in our heart and we ask you, speak to us again. Encounter us again. Transform us again, we pray, by the power of your spirit. And may we never be the same and everybody shouted amen. amen and amen first Wednesday night in a year man there's so much faith and expectation in this room 2020 is over we've spent an entire year asking the question what is the governor going to do what is the CDC going to do What's a new president going to do? What's the media going to do? What are the schools going to do? What is the economy going to do? In 2020, we experienced some legitimate evil, a divisive climate in an election cycle, a virus that claimed millions of lives, disruption, disorder, unrest, chaos, confusion, real pain, authentic loss. But how many people know the devil never plays chess with God and wins? And for an entire year, we've been asking, what are all these entities going to do? And as we turn the page on this new era, on this new season, God says, it's my move. I am about to do something brand new. We have been asking, what, what is... The, the government going to do? What are, all these, what are all these different entities going to do? And God says, now as we start this next chapter, I want you to fix your attention on me because it's my move. I am about to do something brand new. I felt the Lord impress on my heart to not just preach a sermon tonight, but release a prophetic message to this house. Out of Isaiah 43, 19. God makes five statements 
And these five statements are each laden with prophetic implication for us in this moment in history. God says, first, for I, for I am about to do something brand new. See, we serve a God who's not simply wanting to do the next thing, but wanting to do the new thing. God is obsessed with not just doing what's next, but doing what's new. It's part of his nature. It's part of his character. He wants to do things new. Even when we come to Christ, the Bible says if anyone is in Christ, he becomes a new creation. Many of you are here tonight, you, you walked the aisle, you responded to Christ on Easter Sunday, and you're here. This is your first service as a new Christian. Here's what's amazing about our God. He doesn't just improve us, he makes us new. He doesn't just fix us, he makes us new. The Bible says the old is gone and everything becomes brand new. If you've thumbed through the pages of a phone book or do a Google search, you'll see tons of businesses that could fix things. But when you came to Christ on Easter Sunday, God didn't just say, I'm going to fix your broken pieces. He wiped the slate clean and says, you get to start all over. All things new. And God says, I want the new to emerge. The new is ready to emerge in your life. In this next chapter, in this next year, God says it's my move and, and something brand new, something I am about to do, something new. There's new ministries that are emerging. There's new authority that is emerging. There's new favor that is emerging. There's new promotions that are emerging. There's new businesses that are emerging. God says I want to do something brand new. God talked to Abraham in the Old Testament, he said, Abraham, I want to do something new. I, I want to release a new covenant with you. And I want to give a new promise to you. And he said, Abraham, I want to give you a glimpse of your future. He said, look at the stars of the sky. A dark starry night, Abraham gazed at the sky and saw the stars. God said, how many stars are there? Abraham said, God, I, I can't even count. He said, that's how many descendants you'll have. Then he took him to the seaside and he said, Abraham... How many grains of sand are there? Abraham said, God, I can't even count. And God said, that's how many descendants you'll have. They'll be innumerable. What was God doing? He was giving Abraham a glimpse of the new. He was giving Abraham a dominant image because our life always moves in the direction of the dominant images in our heart. As we start this new chapter, what dominant image needs to fill your walls? What picture needs to fill your, your dresser, your bathroom mirror, your dash of your car, your desk? What dominant image needs to go in front of you? I remember as a teenager, I got a hold of this revelation. At 17, I knew that God had called me to go to the nations and to reach people through stadiums. And so when I went to college, I actually printed pictures of stadiums and put them on my wall. Every night before I went to bed, I saw pictures of stadiums. Every morning when I woke up, I saw pictures of stadiums. I thought, God, maybe one day you'll let me take an entire stadium for you. Maybe in my 40s or my 50s. At 20 years old, I led my first team to the Dominican Republic and we had 30,000 people gather and I thought God this is what you showed me when I was a kid this was just a picture on my wall now I'm standing in this place because our life always moves in the direction of the most dominant image in our heart as we start this new season God says I want you to get a picture of your future and put it in front of you because I created you to be a visual being that's why I said Abraham you look at the stars Abraham you look at this I want you to be reminded of where you're going don't you look behind you I want you to look into the place of promise that I've already prepared for you that's why when I was 26, as pastor was saying, and I had the meeting with the president of Honduras, I said, Mr. President, I know the nation's in pain. Unemployment's over 40%. They're calling this the world's murder capital. But there's a scripture in the Bible, Isaiah chapter 66, verse 8, where the ancient prophet asks the question, can a nation be saved in one day? I said, Mr. President, what if in small part Isaiah was speaking to this moment? What if all of Honduras could unite, could be healed, could be saved in one day? I said, but we'll only 
move forward if you'll agree to five things. Number one, stand with me on Saturday, July 20, 2013. And together from the nation's capital, we'll speak to the entire nation. Two, pass legislation through your Congress, calling One Nation One Day an official national holiday. Three, open up every public high school in the nation. Allow our missions teams to come to a one-hour school-wide assembly with an altar call. Four, open up the ports and borders and allow us to ship 18 shipping containers of humanitarian aid and books without any taxes or hang-ups at the borders. And number five, as Pastor mentioned, give us the 18 largest stadiums in the capital cities of all 18 states for free. Now, we didn't know what the president was going to say. But he signed a resolution committing to it. Six months later, the bill passed through the Honduran Congress, and all five of those provisions became law in the nation. We never did two stadiums at one time before that, but that week we did 18 in one day. 1.1 million Honduras hear the gospel in one day. And then the next three nations, we've done 64 stadium events total in the last seven and a half years. And it started with a picture hanging on my wall in my dorm room. And I believe God saying to many of you, that seed of desire, that seed of vision is from me. I planted it there. Get a picture of your future and put it in front of you. I want, to, I want your life, I want you to be consumed with an image of where I'm taking you. God says, I don't want to just do something next in your life. I want to do something brand new, something that your parents never did, something that your grandparents never did, something that your uncles and aunts never did, that your best friends in high school never did. He says, what I'm doing with you is totally and completely new. It is unique. It is something I've already prepared for you. God says, first, as we start this next year, I am doing something. I am going to do it. I'm going to do it brand new. Second thing he says prophetically out of Isaiah 43, 19. He says, see, I have already begun. See, I've already begun. Now, a lot of times with the promises of God, we have to hold on and wait. Sometimes five years or ten years or even decades. But God says in 2021, as it relates to the new thing I'm doing, this is not something you have to wait for. In fact, he says the opposite is true. I've already begun it. I've already begun it. Some of you can already look at the fingerprints of God over the last 12 months. You look at the, 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 the challenges of the pandemic and you say, I could see the fingerprints of God protecting me and insulating me. I could see how he steered me and, and navigated me and watched over me. And I could see how he started to plant vision for this next chapter. I know he's already begun. Here's what you have to know. The fact that he's already begun is all the proof you need he's going to finish it. Because God's character and God's nature is he finishes what he starts. The apostle Paul said, being confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to finish it. How many people are grateful? We serve a God who finishes everything he started. He said, see, I've already begun. I've already begun. You don't have to wait for it. You don't have to wait. It's already in motion. There's something so significant that God has over your life in this next year. It, it's so new. It's so unique. No eye has ever seen. No ear has ever heard. It's not just the next thing. It's the new thing. And God says, be ready because I've already begun. It's already at work. It's already in process. We pivoted our vision for One Day LA from 2020 to 2021. I said, God, is this going to happen? He said, Dominic, it's already begun. Look at what I already did. And the very first fact I started is all the evidence you need, I'm going to finish it. And I'm grateful to say it's happening July of 2021. How many people are grateful that God finishes everything he started? The third prophetic statement over your life. God says, see, I'm going to do something new. I've already begun. Check this out. Number three, he says, do you not see it? Do you not see it? You know what the most frequent saying of Jesus was in the Gospels? The phrase he said the most more than anything else. He said to him who has ears, let him hear. Of all the things he could have been repetitious, he says this one, this statement the most. Apparently, to hear 
and see what God wants us to hear and see, we have to heighten our spiritual senses. Do you ever get a brand new car and all of a sudden for the next month when you're driving to school or driving to work, suddenly you recognize you are a social media influencer because everybody has copied you and is driving the very same car as you. I mean, you see your car, same make, same model, same color, everywhere. It's on the road, it's in your parking lot, it's in your neighborhood. I mean, it's like that, you thought you got the unique car and now everybody's driving your car. Psychologists have a word for this, it's called the bader manoff phenomenon or the frequency illusion. And the fact of the matter is there are 11 million bits of information bombarding our brains every second. Every second, our brain is literally processing and filtering 11 million bits of information. And our brains have to be extremely judicious on what it takes in. So what happened is you bought that new car, and now that's heightened in your subconscious, in your mind, and suddenly it's triggered your brain to recognize it everywhere. And God says about the new thing, I want to do something new. I've already begun. Do you not see? There's got to be something in the, in the core of your being that says the new thing's coming. The new thing's coming. The new thing's coming. The new thing's breaking out. And you are literally looking for it. And if you are, if you are looking for it, you will actually see it everywhere. See, your promotion your favor, your authority, your resource, your breakthrough, your open door, your miracle, your promise, all of it is right in front of you. And God's saying, I need you to see it. I need you. And, and here's how you see it. You get a conviction down in the depths of your soul that the new thing is coming. And it is not only coming, it is here and it is already in motion. And then all of a sudden, everything attached to that thing becoming a reality will become apparent to you. You'll see it everywhere. You'll be bombarded with it. Do you not see it? Do you not see it? Aren't you grateful we don't also, we don't have to rely on our own minds to see it? But Jesus actually said, I'm going to give you my promise of the Holy Spirit, and he's going to give you divine intelligence. And the gifts of the Spirit are words of knowledge, words of wisdom, discernment, prophetic insight. Aren't you grateful that the Spirit of God literally living on the inside of us can speak to us and show us things to come? I don't have to wonder where I'm going in five years. I know exactly where I'm going because the Spirit of God has shown me things to come. Jesus said, when I go, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to give you my Spirit and my Spirit is going to tell you what's coming so you'll be able to see it. See, I am about to do, I want you to hear the authority, the confidence, almost the arrogance in God's voice. I am going to do something new. It's my turn. You've looked to every other thing long enough, but it's my move. It's my move. It's 2021. 2020 is over. It's my move. I am going to do something brand new, God says. See, I've already begun. I've already begun. Do you not see it? Now check this out. He says, I, I want, you to, I want you to feel the confidence in God's voice as he makes this prophetic proclamation over you. He says, I will make a pathway in the wilderness. Now this would have resonated so profoundly for Israel because this is a direct allusion to the Red Sea parting. And God's basically saying to Israel, he's saying, just like I split the Red Sea, I'm making a pathway in the wilderness for you. He's saying, Israel, do you still believe in a God who knows how to split Red Seas? See, I believe with all my heart, God's desperately trying to do the impossible through our lives. In fact, if it's not impossible, God's probably not even involved because it doesn't require him. So God's saying, I want, to, I want to make a pathway through the wilderness. About 10 years ago, I brought 200 missionaries with me to the nation of Peru. And Peru's a unique place because you have the big city of Lima, which is larger than New York City in population. Then you have the mountainous region, that's the second zone 
But then you have the jungle. It's three cultures. It's three landscapes. And the Amazon jungle is unbelievable. We had 200 missionaries with us and we rented these boats and we slept on these boats for seven days. Open sided uh, boats where the air could blow through and we literally slept on hammocks. And then we had 100 Peruvian pastors on the boat with us on the, on the top level. And we went through the Amazon River from city to city. And I'll never forget as we'd step off the boat into these Amazon cities, really these villages, you'd feel the density of the jungle and the thickness of the brush and the, and the difficulty of the terrain. And you'd think to yourself, just to get 100 yards would be a journey. Just to get a mile would be so much work. And I envision you getting off in one of those thick jungle cities and all of a sudden there's this eight-lane highway. And God says that's what this next chapter is going to be like. I am going to make a roadway in the wilderness. I am going to make a pathway in the wilderness. I don't know about you, but when I get ready to take territory, when I get ready to do something new, I think, all right, it's time to fight. It's time to muscle this. It's time to push. And God says, this time I'm going to do it. I'm going to make a pathway in the wilderness. What does that mean? Ease where there should have been struggle. What's the pathway in the wilderness? Acceleration where it should. Acceleration, Pastor Marco. That's why God says this is a year of multiplication again for the way world outreach. He says there's going to be acceleration where it should have been slow. A pathway in the wilderness is you know it was God because strategy didn't do it. We like to say in our ministry, Planning is our diligence, not our dependence. Our dependence is the Holy Spirit. Planning is us stewarding in the natural what God revealed in the supernatural. It's just our diligence. It's not our dependence. And this time you know your planning didn't pull it off. It was God making a roadway in the wilderness. God says, I want to do it. I want to give you an accelerated path where there should be. I want you to... I want you to expect God to go before you in this next chapter and literally clear a way for you. And you're just going to walk behind him and draft behind the wake of his might and his power and his strength and his ability. God says for this next move, I am making a pathway in the wilderness. And then he says, I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. Rivers in the dry wasteland. That means there's abundance where it should be destitute and hopeless. That means there's flourishing where it should be dry and difficult. Some of you are saying, man, my industry was affected this last year. My business model was upended or destroyed. My plans were thwarted. Everything I was working for feels like I've taken 10 steps backwards. And God says, in that wasteland, I am declaring rivers in that wasteland. See, you serve a God who Isaac, the Bible says, sows in famine and in the same year reaps a hundredfold return. Aren't you grateful that God could do whatever he wants, wherever he wants, however he wants? If God says, I'm creating rivers in the desert, then rivers are going to be flowing in that desert place. When God reassigned us to America, see, I thought since I was 17 years old, I'd be working in the nations. I gave the last 15 of my life to developing, 15 years of my life to developing nations, and I thought we were on a trajectory. 15, 20 years in Latin America and Southeast Asia, then we were moving to the Middle East. We had our whole plan. And God begins to reassign us to America, and I thought, perfect. Let's start in Tulsa, Oklahoma, or Birmingham, Alabama. That would probably be the, or maybe Dallas, Texas. That would probably be the best place to start. And God says, no, you're starting in Los Angeles. I said, Lord, but, but Los Angeles is probably going to be very tough. And God says, but I'll create rivers in the desert. I'll create a roadway in the wilderness. I wish I could tell you the miracles that are breaking out right now. It is unfathomable what God is doing. We serve a God who the Apostle Paul is in prison. And the, the people are freaking out. The great giant of the faith, the Apostle, is incarcerated. He's in jail. And Paul writes to the church and says, guys, 
I want you to know that what's happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it's become clear to the whole palace guard and to everyone that I'm in chains for Christ. And the gospel is actually multiplying. See, we serve a God who can create life out of any dry place. And in this season, God says, I'm declaring fruitfulness over every dry place in your life. He's declaring life over your marriage, life over your finances, life over your future, life over your health, life over your family, life over your legacy. We serve a God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. Every dry place in your life, God's saying rivers in that dry place, flourishing in that dry place, new beginnings in that dry place. I refuse to settle for anything less than life in the fullness of God's blessing and the full release of potential in every space. If you have faith for 2021, will you just lift a shout in this place tonight? If you believe that these walls cannot contain the move of God's spirit in and through the Way World Outreach Center, would you release a shout? If you're believing for a double of brand new salvations, double your current congregation in brand new salvations in 2021, would you release a shout? I'm not going to tell you how loud to shout. I'm not going to tell you how long to shout. I'm just going to tell you to shout proportionate to your faith that we are going to double this house with new salvations in 2021. Thank you, Jesus. Shout for your one. 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 We receive it, Lord. You said only ask and I'll give you the nations. We receive an exact double of new salvations from the Way World Outreach in the name of Jesus. God says, I'm declaring life over every area in your life. See, I believe with all of my heart that as the body of Christ, we've not just entered into a new season. Because seasons are a glimpse of what we've seen before. It's springtime in Southern California, and you know what the spring is like. You know the hills get a little bit greener. You know the flowers start to come out because you've lived through that season before. But as the body of Christ, we've not just entered into a new season because that's a glimpse of what we've seen before. We've just entered into a new era. And in this new era, God's moving on his church and through his church like never before in human history. We believe that God is reintroducing. You guys model this so well. But we believe God is reintroducing his people as the people of love again. I believe that God is wanting to rebrand his church. Our qualitative goal as a ministry that in 10 years, whenever somebody hears the word Christ, church, or Christian, the automatic response would be those are the people that love no matter what. Because Jesus said, by this the world will know you're my disciples, that you love one another. And right now when somebody hears the word Christ, Christian church, Christ follower, they might not automatically think those are the people. But how many people believe it's changing? In this new era, he's rebranding his church for love. He's reintroducing himself and his people as the people of love. And I believe in this new era, God's saying, I want you to lead. Sometimes we, we reduce the great commission where Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples of nations. His last assignment, his mandate to us. We reduce that great commission to simply that the church should go or this church should grow. But he didn't say go into all the world and add converts. It wasn't just a mobilization mandate. He said go into all the world and make disciples of nations. Now if I'm going to disciple an individual... I have to lead that individual. But he didn't even just say disciple individuals. He said, I want you to disciple nations. Implicit in that command is that we would lead nations. See, I believe it's time for the church to lead. 
It's time for the church to be found at the head of the boardroom table and the board of education, at the, at the highest offices of government and mass media communications and technology in every area of society. Jesus is saying, I'm giving you the keys. It's time to lead. Isn't it amazing that God gives Adam the earth and says, take leadership, take dominion. Adam sins, relinquishes that authority. But the Bible says when Jesus dies, he goes to hell and he gets those keys back. And he rises from the dead and holding the keys of authority in his hand, he tells the church, all authority in heaven, not just in heaven, and on earth. Don't worry, Adam. I recaptured the authority on the earth. On heaven and on earth, I've recaptured. Therefore, you go and disciple nations. See, we don't march into the cities of the earth or the nations of the earth timid. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, but the violent take it by force. How many people know the cities and nations of the earth do not stand a chance? The mission of God and the people of God are moving forward. And God says, I want you to lead. I want you to lead. See, I believe his prophetic promise over you tonight is I'm doing a new thing. I'm doing a brand new thing no eye has seen, no ear has heard. I've already begun. It's in motion. Do you not see it? I need you to open. I need it to be such a conviction in your soul that you actually see it. You actually have the ability to perceive everything I'm doing to make it happen. I, I am making a roadway. That means acceleration. I am making a roadway. That means ease where it should be a struggle. I am making a roadway. That means the trail has been blazed. The path has been cleared in the wilderness and rivers. I'm declaring life over every dry place. <clears throat> Would you bow your heads all across the room tonight? I'm going to ask you to make a prophetic, physical response as your amen to this word tonight. If you say, Dominic, I receive this as a word from heaven. I take these five prophetic statements out of Isaiah 43 and I say yes. I internalize them. I mix my faith with them. I wrap my heart around them. All across this building, I want you to stand to your feet. And as you stand, you're saying yes to the new thing. You're saying yes to the new thing that he wants to release. And all over the building, would you lift your hands? And quickly, I want you to pray this with authority with me tonight. Say, Lord Jesus, I don't want the next thing. I refuse to settle for the next thing. I want your new thing. What no eye has seen, I've prepared myself for it. Give me a glimpse of it, even now. Now close your eyes and let him give you spiritual sight. Let him give you the ability to see. Lord, open up vision all over this house. Lord, let every teenager be consumed with vision. Let every college student and young adult be inundated with vision to the point where they have to say, God, stop. It's too much. Let every married couple be given new vision for their marriage. <clears throat> let every father and mother be given fresh vision in the name of Jesus. Lord, release clarity of vision for this new thing. And Father, I pray that every drop of anxiety, every seed of doubt, every 
drop of hopelessness would be eradicated in the name of Jesus. And Lord, may we, may we be filled with the spirit of faith and expectation that is unexplainable and unreasonable. Lord, let there be so much hope we don't know what to do with ourselves. I thank you, Father, for releasing it now. In the name of Jesus. Every head bowed and eye closed. If you came to church tonight, maybe you were invited by a friend. <clears throat> maybe this is your first time in an environment like this, but you say, I'm not right with God. I don't, I don't know that I'm walking with God. I don't know that I have a personal relationship with him. I've never made Jesus my Lord, my Savior. The Bible says your sins could be forgiven. You could have confidence of eternal life. You could know that when you die, you spend eternity in heaven. If that's you tonight, would you just slip your hand up? I want to pray with everybody that needs to make a commitment to Christ tonight, that needs to know that they know their sins are forgiven. Let's, let's, let's thank God for these hands being lifted. Church, would you pray this with everybody whose hands are lifted now? Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross to take my place. Forgive me of my sin. Forward, be my Savior, my God, my King.